Module 5, The Adolescent. Early adolescence, or pre-adolescence pubescence, is the period between ages 10 and 12 years. It begins with a dramatic growth spurt and signals the advent of puberty. True adolescence is the period between ages 13 and 18 years and begins with the onset of menstruation and the production of sperm. These children are sometimes fascinated and sometimes fearful and confused about the changes that are occurring in their bodies and thinking process. They begin to look grown up, but they lack adult judgment and independence. Uncertainty and turmoil can create conflicts that can actually delay development and prevent maturing into fully functioning adults. They have to develop their own identity, <clears throat> a sense of being independent people with unique ideals and goals. Stress, anxiety, and mood swings are typical of this phase, and they really add to the feelings of role confusion. Now, with pre-adolescent development, this occurs in girls about 9 to 11 years of age. Excuse me. They have a growth spurt of about 3 inches per year until menarche. They begin to have more adult-like contours at this point in their life. Menarche will begin adolescence. With boys ages 11 to 13, it's slower but steadier growth rate than girls. And nocturnal emissions are often seen. This will indicate adolescence is beginning. Boys and girls do require discussions about their own and the opposite gender. It is going to require open, honest discussions and if we don't give it to them, they often get inaccurate information from unreliable sources. With adolescent development, this spans the ages of about 13 to 18 years. But some boys may not complete this until they're around 20 years of age. Rate of development is going to vary greatly. There, this is a time of many physical, emotional, and social changes. These children struggle to master some of these developmental tasks. Completement of earlier development tasks are a prerequisite for mastering the ones they're going through now. Look at Table 27.2 in your textbook for more details. So with physical development, girls are going to achieve 98% of their adult height by the time they are 16 years old. Boys can continue to grow once again until they're about 20. The skeletal system is going to outpace muscular system growth and bone growth is usually completed at this point. Primary sex organ changes begin to enlarge and we start seeing secondary sexual characteristics appear and that hormonal activity increases. Menstruation begins and when it does, pregnancy is possible. Breast development happens and pubic hair begins to appear in the girls. With the guys, penis, testes, and scrotum are adult in size and shape. We see mature spermatozoa produced, pubic hair mature, muscle strength and coordination begin to improve, and they also go through that voice change. Psychosocially, Freud states they are moving from the latency stage to the genital stage, and Erickson states says they're going from industry versus inferiority to identity versus role confusion. Paget says they are going from concrete operational thinking to formal operational thinking. Whatever theory you ascribe to, these kids are developing a sense of moral judgment and a system of values and beliefs that are going to affect their entire life. 
a foundation of family, religious groups, school, and community experiences are still a strong influence. But trends and fads will dictate a lot of their choices, and we begin to see some family conflicts and peer pressure. These kids need careful guidance and understanding and support. With personality development, Erickson says they're beginning to develop their identity. These kids have a greater variety of choices and now they begin to seek intimate relationships. Their body image is closely related to their self-esteem. The culture greatly influences their beliefs. And a lack of perceived inadequacy is going to lead to stress in this age group. They may attempt inappropriate steps to correct perceived inferiorities. They need to establish that positive body image, and they may need help accepting their body as it is, especially for factors that cannot be altered, such as height. So when we're collecting data from the adolescent, these kids can provide information about themselves. And we need to consider interviewing them in private because it often will encourage them to share more information that they might not contribute whenever their family is around. Questions of a sensitive nature should be asked in private, such as substance abuse or sexual practices. Again, collecting that objective data is going to include all of the measurements of height, weight, vital signs, and examination of the body systems. <clears throat> Excuse me. Again, respect the child's privacy. <coughs> Excuse me. And keep them covered until a specific part of the body is examined. Using all of those observations, that data that we've collected, use that to um, help play in their care and make sure that you pay special attention to this specific complaint they have. Heart rate, we need to do the radial pulse. If it is unusual in quality or rate, make sure that you're counting for a full minute and getting that apical heart rate. The normal ranges for children at different ages and with their blood pressure. So medication administration, once again, don't give them a choice as to whether or not they're going to be getting the medication. They uh, need it, but we do need to give them as many choices as we can to allow them some control. Again, we never lie, keep those explanations simple, but brief in language the child will understand. Do not talk about them as if they were not there. Be very positive when you're dealing with these kids, firm and assertive. Keep uh, time as minimal as possible between explanation and execution. Depending on how they deal with needles or medication, etc., we might need to consider doing this out of their sight. As with any other pediatrics, when we have to do pediatric drug calculations, make sure that another nurse or someone who is qualified to administer medications does a second computation to make sure that your numbers are correct. Again, the medication is going to come in a variety of forms and we have to go with what the child is able to handle. You know, can they swallow the pills, etc. Make sure you use the appropriate calibrated device to administer their medication. And some of those liquids might need to be diluted, so follow proper procedure. Question, at what approximate age does muscle strength and coordination generally develop in the boys? Thirteen years. 
So with nutrition, these kids need that balanced diet that consists of all those food groups, as with everyone. And these are going to be their requirements. It will be based on their growth. Boys are going to need more calories than girls. Again, needs are based on their growth, not their age. They need more food to provide necessary energy to meet those growth needs. Their food choices, unfortunately though, are often going to be influenced by peer pressure, causing them to make bad choices such as skipping meals, eating that fast food or high caloric nutritional deficient snacks throughout the day. Deficient nutrients, uh, nutrients that they may experience would be in calcium, iron, zinc, vitamins A, D, B6, and folic acid. And for more information, look at table 27.4 in your text. These kids might experiment with food fads and diets and make bad choices, especially girls and athletes. <coughs> Excuse me. They may resist pressure from their family to eat that balanced diet. In addition, there might be some cultural challenges with low income, belief systems, habits, and customs. There might be dietary restrictions such as lactose intolerance, allergies, or self-imposed restrictions. Their choices might be related to religious, ecological, philosophical reasons such as a vegetarian diet. It does require careful planning to provide adequate nutrients to the uh, vegetarian diet. And there's different types of vegetarians. We have the semi-vegetarian, the lacto-ovo vegetarian, the lacto-vegetarian, and the vegan. We do need to encourage whole grain products, legumes, nuts, seeds, and fortified soy substances. These kids, even though they're getting bigger and they're getting older, they still need to have a couple of checkups during their teen years every year. Uh, annual physical exams are encouraged. Make sure you get the complete history and their immunizations are up to date. They need a basic health assessment, and this includes vision and hearing. If they're sexually active, they should have appropriate exams done to include STIs and a pap smear in the girls. Body piercings and tattoos may be prominent. We need to educate these kids on signs and symptoms of infection. Make sure that you observe privacy and provide individualized attention confidentiality, and allow them the right to participate in their decisions. This is really important. Dental checkups should be done every six months. Dental malocclusion is a common condition and may require some orthodontia, where we treat malocclusion with braces. We may also see tongue piercings, and there is a concern for infection and tooth damage with tongue piercings. Family teaching. This is a difficult process for a young person and family caregiver. We need to balance the uh, decision making by allowing the young person to make some of their own decisions while safeguarding them from risky and immature behavior. Concerning issues for this age group include their sexuality, potential substance abuse, accidents, discipline, poor nutrition, and those volatile emotions. Don't you just love hormones? Good communication is essential. Family caregivers might need anticipatory guidance and emotional support to deal with this age group. Health education and counseling include sexuality. A good foundation in sex education is very important. And it helps prepare the child for events of puberty, 
menstruation and nocturnal emissions. <clears throat> there is a responsibility concerning responsible sexuality, contraception, and STIs. And the kids need to know that if they're going to engage in sexual practices, they need to observe safe sexual practices. It is very important that they receive regular examinations and understand what is normal and not normal. We also need to teach self-examination of the breasts and testes, making certain that we're using the right sources for information. Again, we need to teach sexual responsibility, including safe sexual practices, contraceptive information, how to prevent STIs, when to seek medical treatment, and rohypnol precautions. For example, don't leave drinks unattended. Uh, the date rape drug is very common and unfortunately can lead to some really bad situations. With substance abuse, sometimes this occurs because of peer pressure or the child just for kicks is going along with the crowd or might be rebelling against parents or might be used to escape a bad situation. This could include alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, cocaine, heroin, ecstasy, and other street and prescription drugs. Unfortunately, substance abuse is also frequently accompanied by irresponsible sexual behavior. We also need to address the mental health of these uh, kids. Stress can lead to depression, suicide, and conduct disorders. They may have academic, social, and family, family situations that just add to their stress. They may require counseling or just someone to talk to really important to teach them internet safety. And parents need to be aware of their computer activities and the sites that have been accessed. Discussions with adolescents concerning safety concerns are really important. And there is a box in your textbook entitled Internet Safety. So question. Teens can feel ashamed about the changes in their body if they're unprepared for these vast changes. True or false? This is true. Another true or false question. A non-judgmental, matter-of-fact approach is best when discussing complicated issues with adolescents. This is another true question. And now for the post-test. <clears throat> 